Daisy. And I'm Terry. And this is the Monday, Monday Mindset, Mindset Podcast. Podcast, where we share things of interest to us and hopefully to you. So let's get started with episode 89. And today it's Daisy's turn to share something with us. Daisy, what do you have? Well, Terry, this week I am back with a podcast that, well, I say used to be my favorite. It hasn't stopped being one of my favorites. It's just one that I haven't listened to much of late, quite a few months. And that is Feel Better, Live More with Rongan Chatterjee. And towards the end of last year, he introduced what he calls bite size episodes, which are as the name implies, shorter episodes that are the sort of, I guess, the salient points from another episode. So there's always another episode to refer back to. And this bite-sized episode is number 229, The Four Steps to Make Habits Stick with James Clear. Ah. Now, before you say anything, (laughs) I know... I've already done actually two episodes. I looked them up on James Clear and actually they were relating to the original episode that this came from, which was episode number 145, How to Build Good Habits and Break Bad Ones with James Clear. And it was one of those episodes that's so content rich, it took me two episodes to cover it. But I just thought I would listen to this and see if anything fresh came of it. And I'm not saying that I won't be repeating myself at all. And he was obviously repeating himself. But I felt like there were things that I needed to hear. There were things that felt like they were new. So I thought I would share them with you, especially as I know that James Clear is one of your favorites. I was going to say you can never get enough James Clear episodes. Exactly. (laughs) Always going to be useful. Something that I've, a person that I've been mentioning over and over, over on Keto Woman with the Keto Curious series that I've been doing. But they kick off this episode with a great couple of quotes. James Clear starts off by saying, really, and you know, he's all about habits and behavior. And he says, your current life today is largely the sum of your habits. The habits you've been following for the last six months, year, whatever, they've carried you to the results you have now. And he quotes a friend of his who said to him, if you're enjoying good results right now, you were killing it six months ago. And Rongan commented how much he liked this quote and how true it is. You know, habits, they build, they compound. And James talks about the result is not the thing that needs to change. It's the system that precedes the result that you're looking for, the habits that precede the outcome. He says, fix the inputs and the outputs will fix themselves. And Rongan mentioned New Year's resolutions, and it's one of the reasons why I thought this would be a perfect time to revisit James Clear and habits, because a lot of people will probably be in that position where they're trying to impose some New Year's resolutions, some new habits, some behavior changes. And they talk about how most of us judge success of habits a bit too early and tend to give up, tend to get in uh, black and white thinking a bit too much. It's sort of all or nothing. We're generally, as a society, very results focused. You don't tend to hear, he says, about the process that tends to be hidden from view. You know, you hear about the dramatic 100 pound weight loss. You don't hear every day about the chicken salad or bacon and eggs more in our way of eating, whatever it is that went into that. You don't hear about the quote unquote boring details. It's the results that are discussed and celebrated and therefore tend to be valued. 
They talked about what's in the title, Four Steps to Make Habit Stick, what he calls his four laws of behavior change. And he says, get these levers in the right position and working for you and you're going to find it a lot easier. Number one, make them obvious. Most habits, he says, are preceded by a cue. So make it very visible. They need to be attractive, motivating and compelling. So number two, attractive. Number three, easy. The more easy, convenient, frictionless, the better. And I remember from one of the episodes I did before, I can remember we were talking about things that have friction and are frictionless and how you uh, want to apply more friction to habits you want to break and make things as frictionless as possible for habits you're wanting to put in place. So number three, make it easy. Number four, satisfying. The more satisfying and enjoyable this new habit is, the more likely you are to stick to it. These new habits you're trying to put in place need to be rewarding in some way if you want to be able to make them sustainable. And so Rongan says, okay, so someone's wanting to start with a new habit. What should they be doing? And James says the best place to start, in his opinion, is with what he calls his two minute rule. And this refers to his third law making it easy. And the idea is that you scale it down to make it easy. You purposefully limit to make it almost too easy. And he refers to this as what you're practicing is you're mastering the art of showing up. And he says a habit must be established before it can be improved. It has to become the standard before you can even start thinking about optimizing it. And they talked again about this um, all or nothing. And he mentioned something here and I put a great big circle around it and exclamation marks because this is one of the things I had to put both hands up to. He said, we tend to put off action because we feel we need to learn more. And as you well know, this is something that I've been experiencing of late. Mm -hmm. But he says, usually anyway, the best way to learn is to take action. And I can absolutely attest to this. Yes, the new skill I've needed to acquire took some learning. There were some steps I had to take to learn. But I do get into that mindset, that headspace of feeling like I need to learn everything. And time was becoming an issue. And it got to the point where if you don't start applying this, you're going to lose out on the opportunity. But what did I find when I did that? I had actually got to a point there where I'd learned enough to get started. And so I started the doing And so, as he says, usually the best way to learn is to take action. So I started taking that action, started applying the things that I had learned that I did need to learn. But what it also, what I find is it also highlights is you can be more targeted in your approach with the next things you need to learn. You can really get a much better idea of the skills you need to acquire because there's always going to be huge amounts that you could learn. But, you know, what do you really need to learn? And it, it brings to mind also something that I was told that very much went against how I learned at school. So when I was at school, you know, you had the curriculum that you worked through and then there was an exam at the end of it. And the point was you didn't know what was going to be in the exam. It could be anything from this, all this stuff that you'd learned. And it was actually Jim Quick who pointed this out. He said, the best way to learn is to ask questions. 
And a course I was doing a while ago, I decided to apply this approach. Instead of doing all the learning first and then testing yourself, look at the test questions first. And Jim Quick talks about this, doesn't he? Ask yourself questions all the time when you're reading, when you're learning, because it helps you absorb the information that you need. And that's what came to mind with this Yes, you might need to put some skills in place before you can start, but start as soon as you can, because that really is part of the process. So I've gone off on a bit of a a tangent there, but he says that this two minute rule helps you overcome this perfectionist research tendency. Keep the bar low and get in the repetition He says it's almost always better to do less than you hoped than nothing at all. It's a good way to go in the right direction. Master the art of showing up, even if it's in a small way. Use that as a foothold to advance to the next level. Build momentum. And of course, you get that feeling of progress. And it's easier to build once you have that scaffold. Exactly. It's hard to build something tall when you have no scaffolding. But if you're already there with some safe scaffolding, then you can keep going. Go up to the next level rather than feeling like you've got to build the tower block before you can go in there. Mm. (laughs) They go on to talking about rewarding yourself. And he says that the ultimate reward is feeling like you are showing up as the type of person you want to be. You're reinforcing your desired identity. But this takes time. The key here is to get some immediate rewards so that you can tie the behavior to feeling good. And it gives you then a reason to repeat the behavior. And um, he says habit trackers are quite good for this. You know, even putting a, a gold star on your calendar. It made me think actually of the swimming badges that they're really fond of, the blue tits that I swim with. They have different badges for, you know, achieving different things, going to a moon swim or so many cold swims or whatever it is, they get a badge. Interestingly, personally, I kind of rebel a bit against that. I don't know whether it's my rebel tendency. I'm not sure what it is. But it says you need a visual reminder that it was a good thing to do. Actually, I was thinking about this when I was filling in my new spreadsheet I've got for all the podcasts that I edit. I have different columns that I put a tick in when they're done. And it does feel good to tick things off. So that's a very easy way to get an immediate reward. Um, But he says, if, if you're looking at external rewards, you're treating yourself. He says the key with these is that they are aligned with the internal identity you're trying to build. So you don't reward yourself um, for going to the gym by eating donuts on the way home. That's not rewarding with this new gym goer, healthier identity that you're trying to build. And as we know, his biggest thing, and this is where he wraps up this bite-sized episode or where Rongan wraps it up, I guess I should say. It was a much longer episode to start with. Um, The true behavior change, and again, I can attest to this, is identity change. Assign identities to yourself and it will change the way you see these new habits. They won't be an obligation. They're just part of who you are. The goal is the identity. So the goal is not to run a marathon, but to become a runner. The goal is not to get to a meditation retreat. The goal is to become a meditator. And habits, which is what he's all about, reinforce this new identity that you want to have. They reshape the way you think about yourself. I think this is where he gets really excited, isn't it? It's all about just improving yourself, being happier with yourself, And this is something that I can remember mentioning 
before in one of the episodes that I did, but I, I really liked it. Every action you take is like a vote for the type of person you want to become. So every time you take one of those little steps, however small they are, in the direction that you want to head in, you're casting a vote. And those votes add up. They start to build a body of evidence. And sooner or later, the weight shifts and that identity is the new you. But yes, it does take some time. But in those moments, in every one of those small steps, in that moment, you are that person and you're casting those votes. And they don't go away. They build up. They accumulate. So there you have it. That's a little bit of repetition probably, but I still felt like I was taking something new. Like you were saying, you can never get enough of James Clear. (laughs) And also to me, just the topic of habits probably one of the most common topics nowadays. There are so many books about it because we all recognize this is something we're working on and need to work on because it's what sets our course. Our habits set our course. And many of us either aren't aware of what our habits are or we're aware that we have some really problematic habits that are taking us in a totally different course than where we want to be and need to focus on that. So this is also very timely for me because I'm doing some work in the fasting method community about habit building. And so any reminder about James (laughs) Clear's work is always useful for me. And one of the most important things I took from what you said, again, is just that reinforcement that the habits you're building really do need to work toward an identity. And sometimes I might use one of your examples and stretch it a little further. So let's say, for example, it's not that you want to just run a marathon. You want to be a runner. And I might say for some people, that might even be the identity of being a runner isn't that valued to them, but the identity of being someone who's active and healthy Mm. and mobile Mm. is valuable to them. So the habit of running is super important. So sometimes the identity that we're working for is maybe even a broader health goal type of person as far as I want to be more philanthropical. I want to give more. I want to do more for other people. Great. Then I'm going to have to build habits that create the opportunity for me to experience myself that Mm -hmm. way. I can't just say I'm going to be more philanthropic. I have to build in those habits that allow me to express that part of myself and make that a consistent part of how I do my life. So I love that idea of the identity being so important in this process. I like that as well. I like how you expanded on that example of being a runner because it also opens up by being a bit broader with the identity, it opens up the possibility of change. Mm -hmm. If for any reason, that goal, that identity has to change, you know, and if you are somebody who has that tendency to get into all or nothing, if for any reason, the being a runner becomes off the table, well, it doesn't matter because there's another route to that Mm -hmm. identity goal. While you were talking about it, I was actually thinking of an example you had shared earlier on in the podcast. And I think this might be a good example to highlight this idea. It wasn't about an episode on James Clear. It was an episode when you were talking about the challenge of getting up in the morning, getting out of bed. And your rebel mind was saying, I'm not going to get up. I'm not going to change it. You can't set an alarm and make me get up. (laughs) But I think over time, and maybe it's more clear now with your habits now, it wasn't so much you wanted to become an early riser. So create a habit so that you can become an early riser. You wanted to become someone, I'm putting these words into your mouth, but watching you now, who is active, who does things, who starts the day out actively and gets the ball rolling. 
You didn't say, I want to be an early riser. Uh, yes. One thing that I did say, though, was, and I think you've hit the nail on the head, is I wanted to be more productive. Uh-huh. And that's a real good example of ends to means, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah. And so setting up an early rising routine mm. has created you being more productive, has led to that. So I, I think it's really cool to look at an example like that, because in the beginning, when we were first talking about it, it would have been easy to say, well, I don't really care if I'm an early riser. That's not an identity I really want or care about. But you do really care about being productive. And that habit of early rising makes that possible. And it's also a good example of quite often, well, mostly it takes time to get there. Mm -hmm. And you don't necessarily know what you're doing. You sort of stumble across things and things fall into place piece by piece. You know, I couldn't have mapped this out mm -hmm. You know, James Clear talks about figure out the identity, you know, the person that you want to be. Well, it's not always that easy. It's a bit mm -hmm. like asking someone what they want to be when they grow up. You know, I never knew. Sometimes, I don't know, it, it kind of happens by accident, mm -hmm. but it is steps towards it. And, you know, you figure it out as you go and it becomes clearer. Mm -hmm. And you're just like, oh, okay, yes, that's what I was working towards mm -hmm. and will continue working towards. Absolutely. I think another important concept from this rehash of James Clear is the idea of rewarding, that we have to reinforce habit building through reward, but so often we misthink what the reward should be. We reward ourselves with old kind of rewards that we're used to, food, money, and really talking more even about those kind of intrinsic rewards. I feel good that I started my day earlier today. I feel empowered that four days this week, I got up soon after sunrise. That's a big accomplishment for me. Mm -hmm. That internal recognition and celebrating ideally, is even more powerful than, well, I'm going to pay myself some money since I got up early, or I'm going to get a donut because I got up early. Mm. Because that's going to interfere in other ways. And it, it makes that behavior tied to an external reward versus tying it to that internal reward. This feels good when I'm doing this. Mm. And it's immediate. Yeah. And I feel accomplished. And then again, it builds that momentum. Having an external reward generally doesn't build the momentum. Eh, I can get a donut today or I cannot. Do I want one? Mm, okay. I don't need to keep doing it. Mm. But do I want to feel good today? Yeah, I do. So I'm going to do it. And we keep building from there. External rewards are a little harder to build momentum with. And it helps the next time. Mm -hmm. You know, especially it, often it's with exercise I can remember when you know when I was doing the couch to 5k and I did actually quite enjoy it but I had to remind myself of that often when I was heading out the door and didn't feel like doing it mm -hmm. but you've got the experience of it making you feel good so that you can remind yourself but the thing that I really took away from this episode, a little nugget that I really like that we could wrap up with is this idea of every action you take working towards the person you want to become, that every small step you take, every action, however tiny you take, is like a vote for the type of person you want to become. And I, I just had an idea then of how you could even put little scraps of paper in a jar, you know, literally cast a vote for yourself every time. And particularly if you're one of these people who tends to this all or nothing and giving up, it's a great visual reminder when maybe you've had a bad day, a bad week, a bad month, well, you haven't lost those votes. They're still there. Mm -hmm. you, you still cast all those votes for yourself. They haven't gone away. They've still been accumulating. And there's nothing to stop you if 
for some reason, things have gone wrong for a while. There's nothing to stop you adding to that jar again. You've still got Mm -hmm. those votes that you've already cast for yourself that you can build on. Absolutely. Well, I hope you and everyone else at home managed to take some more priceless nuggets from James Clear and will help you in what I hope will be a very wonderful week. And thanks for sharing this again, Daisy. As I said, I'm always excited when I get to talk about (laughs) and think about James Clear's work. And I hope everyone has a great week. Take good care, everybody. Bye.